Men are the prize, the podcast. I'm Harvey, your host. How are you? How you doing? I'm hoping the week is great. Life is great. The struggle is minimal. And you're as happy as can be. Um, if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know me, you know, stay-at-home dad, parent, all that good stuff. But I'm a child of divorce. My parents got divorced when I was 10. You probably know this. I've told the story. My parents got divorced when I was 10. I had to go to court. I had to testify as to who I wanted to live with. So divorce to a degree has had a major effect on relationships and a lot of what I do. In life. And as I was talking to quickly to my guest, there's always kind of an emphasis on what does the wife do? what, How do the kids deal with it? But there's rarely discussion about the man. He got divorced too. What happens with him? What's with his psyche, his sanity? What do we do for men? Do they get help? Do they deserve help? You know, we're just men, you know, I don't know if that's supposed something to happen. So I was lucky enough to find somebody who I think can kind of fill in some holes and we can talk about it from experience. My guest this week is Ralph Brewer, better known as DSO. And we're going to talk about that. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm well. Thank you. Good. Thank you, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, oh, this is great. I'm really glad to talk to you. Quick introduction. DSO is the pen name for Ralph, founder of the Dad Starting Over website, DSO. The Dad Starting Over podcast, author of several books, including his most popular title, The Dead Bedroom Fix, and founder of the DSO fraternity, a private group for men only. I think that's, I mean, everything I like, but it. the whole, the private group, I like that. A space for men to just, it's here, I can say what I want. Mm. No judgment, no reprisal. It's a safe space. And I've lately I've kind of discovered that the word safe has a different connotation mm -hmm. for people. Women safe, I feel like is a literal thing. Safe in my in my space. Who's yeah. around me? Am I gonna get attacked? Men, it's a more internal thing. Do I feel safe where I am? Who I'm talking to? Can I am I safe enough to say whatever I want? So I feel like that's important when we talk about men. But that's why we've got you here. We're going to talk about it. Very good. So, are you ready to go? I am. Let's do it. Excellent. All right. So if you're a new listener or watcher, thank you. If you're not, then you know what I'm going to do. Prize is the big part of this podcast. I take letters from the word prize. Each of the four of the letters represent a characteristic that I think delineate good, good things for a man to be. And we're going to talk about that. So the first letter in the word prize is P. The word is purpose. Purpose is defined as reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. So what is your purpose now? Wow. If you had asked me that question 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, totally different answer. Simply because as far as I was concerned at that time, my purpose was I have at that time three little kiddos. I need to take care of them. And beyond that, not a whole hell of a lot be quite honest with you. Um, the term we use in our DSO world is mission. If somebody had pulled me aside and said, what's your mission, young man? I'd been like, I, 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 I stay alive, keep food on the table. I don't, yeah. beyond that, I don't yeah. know what the hell do you mean mission? You know, what am I, a military guy or something? No, I'm just some dad. And then right. when divorce and all that nastiness happen and you're thrown out into the world like a little helpless child saying, there you go, go, have at it. All of a sudden you're like, <clears throat> well... <laughs> Now what? Um, I don't have the kids part of the time. And then when you're left alone at home, a lot of men realize, myself included, wow, I really don't have a whole hell of a lot of anything beyond feeding kids, homework, coaching. I coached all the teams. I mean, it was super dad, extraordinary, all that stuff. Take that away, albeit temporarily, but take it away for a bit and you're left with what now? And a lot of men just are like, shit, I don't know. So I went on this this journey of self-discovery and self-reflection and all that fun stuff. And it led me to some previous passions I had in life, pre-kids, pre-marriage and everything. And one of those was writing. I just love to do creative writing, journaling, that kind of stuff. Just totally lost track of that completely in my life. And I started writing on the topic of this whole thing about my debt. Who am I? What am I? This thing that happened to me. Why did it happen to me? What do I do now? How do, how do I recover from this? And at first, the writings were limited to things like online discussion forums and things like that, where guys get together and chat. And um, eventually, some people liked what I wrote because it was pretty lengthy because I just love to hear myself 
talk, so to speak, apparently. <laughs> so you should put this in a blog format. So I did. And uh, that didn't get much traffic unless I talked about um, things about sex and marriage, which was a big issue for me in my first marriage. Not to divulge too much private information, but it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. And so that was a problem for me. And guess what? It's a problem for like every freaking dude that's married, it seems. Not a, every is an exaggeration, but it's damn near close. And so I wrote a book on that. And you mentioned it before, The Dead Bedroom Fix. That took off. So then by virtue of, I guess the happenstance of life and me pursuing this pre previous passion of writing and doing it again, what is my purpose kind of happened to me. It was my purpose became helping others. It became, I read this book of yours. It was really great. Do you mind talking to me? Maybe, maybe via Skype or phone call or text. And I would be talking to men. And the next thing a man would say, you know, this isn't really fair. You should charge for your time. You're really good at what you do. Have you ever thought about charging like for coaching or something like, coaching and every, I've heard of the concept, but beyond that, I don't know much about it. So I researched and said, hang my shingle. Not only am I an author, but I am a coach. And that really took off. And now fast forward several years, I started this men's group and I have other men working for me. They do coaching. There's so much of it. We have to all share. And we got guys in Bolivia, Australia, all over the US. And um, there's a real need for that. So this has for the past decade or so became my purpose, my passion, my mission helping others. And then there's the selfish entrepreneurial side of it, which is running a business, which I love a great deal. I'm a very business minded kind of guy. I have that, that, that itch. I always have always had a little side business as a kid and stuff. So it's worked hand in hand, this helping others business thing, pursuing my own passion. It's relatively new to me and I love it. It's a new me, so to speak. So I talk to a lot of men like you, I coach, and I talk to men about things. And a few things that you said really resonate with pretty much, excuse me, every man I talk to. A lot of men don't consider themselves a separate entity. Meaning, I ask men, what do you do to self-soothe? Because we, as men, have the weight of the world thrust upon our shoulders. We are taking care of people. We're taking care of our kids and their gaming systems and potentially our spouse and the car and life and the bills and all this stuff. And lost in that is taking care of yourself. The fact that you like you, you um, I guess, rediscovered stuff that you like to do says a lot. You got married, you had a family and all of a sudden all the things that you like to do, all things that kind of made you who you are, mm -hmm. just kind of fell, just fell on the wayside. And we just fall into that. So I like, you know, you like to read, you like to golf, you like to do these things, but all that's all of a sudden that stuff goes away because everybody else has to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. It's such a big deal with men. Yeah. So hearing you talk about that, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's very much fun. And that's previous you. And once you had the chance to kind of put yourself in the forefront again, you kind of discovered, you know, I don't have anybody else to take care of. Hey, maybe I take care of me. What do you think? That sounds like yeah. a good idea. Um, I do want to ask though, because I did, I feel like I put the cart before the horse. Would you mind as much as, as willing as you're willing to talk about how you got up, how, you know, your relationship, marriage, divorce, how you got to that. And then kind of the after effects, how the marriage happened, what happened exactly? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, how the divorce yeah. happened maybe because I, we know how you went there. Sure. I, I've shared the details and it's a big part of my online persona is the fact that right. I discovered my then wife was having an affair, an extramarital affair. And that just absolutely crushed me. And I did what a lot of guys do, which is, okay, can we just talk about this first? Can you, you can you not break up the family? Because her reaction once found out was, all right, we're done. No, like, hey, I'm sorry, let's work this out. It was just basically, I've been caught. Oh, shit. Well, cat's out of the back now. But obviously, we're all done here. And I did what a lot of guys do, groveling. And no, 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 let's keep our family together. Can we not work this out? And um, make a long story short, that didn't happen. And I did the therapy and did all of that. And then eventually, you know, came out of the, whole, so to speak, emotionally of what was I thinking with all of this groveling and begging and all this other stuff? It's time to, you know, what's the term? Pull my, put my, pull myself up by my bootstraps and get to work and just realize, dude, it is what it is. This is what life handed you make the best out of it. And, um, it, uh, there was a period of time there for several years in the early stages of the divorce where I had the kids the vast majority of the time. And I could, you know, I, I could really uh, lay blame on the ex for a lot of things, but 
she was going through a lot mentally, emotionally at that time. The 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 affair was symptomatic of a lot of other things. Um, she was a child of chaos, so to speak. She came from not so good background, all the other stuff, and it all ba basically combined with an overstressed mom and work and her baggage and everything else, and it just blew up all at once. And the affair was just part of that. And continuing part of that was, and now I have emotionally attached for my children and my obviously my husband, and I'm going to pursue this life 2.0. Um, but to her credit, we have not verbalized this, but it has been made kind of obvious that she's realized, oh shit, what did I do? And has turned around and said, um, I'm back to being mom again. And um, that's been for like the past five, six years now. And she's done a wonderful job of helping with the logistics and everything and co-parenting and all that stuff. And I couldn't ask for a, a better co-parent partner in that way. Um, but there was a period of years, there's several years at the beginning where it was, it was bad. It was a lot of stress on me. I remember looking at the calendar saying, I wonder how much, what percentage of time I actually have the kids. And I tracked all the days through the year and totaled all up. And it was something like 78% of the time I had the kids. And when one of those kids is a year and a half old, um, I failed to mention that. I had one that was only a year and a half old at the time when all this went down. Yeah. And um, so that was extra tough. So you got a kid in diapers, coaching the other two, driving them all over the damn place. And everything. that was really tough. So that's what I had to endure doing all that. So it kind of helps paint a picture of you know, how I got here. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. I'm a stay-at-home dad of the four. You heard we talked about that. So I, I understand what you're talking about. I just haven't had, I don't have one that young by mm. myself but dealing with four older kids it's still chaos so imagine one who pretty much needs you for everything i can't mm -hmm. even i can't even comprehend that so but i will say this sounds really bad i i would expect nothing less as a parent i as a father let me rephrase that i have a real issue with how i'm perceived how dads are perceived like this whole idea, look, he's babysitting or look what he's doing is helping mom. I hear what you're saying and I'm glad that you did it, but I would expect nothing less from a father. That is your damn job mm. to take care of them kids yeah. into even to the detriment of our sanity. These are the kids <laughs> who didn't get chosen to, brought, to be brought into this world mm. we brought in. So I am not I don't I'm not expecting praise for people when they when they hear I take care of my kids and I don't throw it out either. Good job, dad. It's just a regular, that's what we do. That's what we look up yeah. to do. That's our damn job. And that's what I take it as. Um, do you remember literally how you were feeling? So this, let me rephrase. I've said to my wife, I have one thing that I cannot deal with in our marriage. I said, I can deal with anything. You cheat on me, it's a wrap. That's the one thing I said, good or bad. Mm hmm I get into a relationship and I have to trust you. So I'm not going to be the one in your phone checking your calendar, bugging you. If I'm marrying you, I trust you. So I could I could be the naive one who gets who finds out his wife is cheating. And if you do that, it's a wrap. Anything else will work on. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you felt? So the, your, the divorce is kind of final. It's kind of official that this relationship is not going to work. Not in terms of your family, but in terms of you. Ego, whatever, id. How did you feel like right after that was done? Where were you? I, I would say demolished. Yeah, very much so. I mean, infidelity in particular is, is especially insidious. Um, I often say to guys, it, it calls into question your present. Like, what does this mean for us as a couple? Are we done or not? What am I? Am I a single dad now? What does this mean? Future. You know, what? Um, what what's in store for me? Because I had my future planned out as far as I was concerned for the next so many decades and whatever. Now that's done. So what's my future hold? What I found to be the most insidious part of all that was it calls into question the past. What you thought was reality is suddenly, oh, shit, does that mean because this happened that, oh, now it's starting to make, oh, so my friend was hinting at the fact that he knew about, you know, just all kinds of craziness of, so it's a real mind F, basically. Mm -hmm. And then I, that's all, and you're still processing all this and the divorce is done and here you go and you're thrust out in the world. Oof. Yeah, that's tough. It was absolutely, yeah, debilitating. And um for a lot of, I didn't go down this road where for a lot of men, it becomes a substance abuse thing, you know, alcohol, overeating drugs, um, messing around with not so good women as a, well, I've, I've learned from talking to a lot of men. Oh, that's very common. Men jump to other women real fast. 
uh, especially if you come from a very broken background and you have a codependency streak, which a lot of these men that I talk to do, they can't live life without a woman. And as soon as one's gone, they need a replacement right away. And more often than not, they find a replacement that is really not very good for them. And, um, but I didn't do that, thankfully, not as far as uh, latching on and partnering up with one. I did date way too soon. I did do that. That's for another story. But um, yeah, that was tough. That was basically the genesis of all this was the pain that I was going through and trying to deal with it. That's good. That's, it's, I think it's the fact that you can kind of, you can kind of see where you were and kind of the journey. You can see the steps taken to get to where you are. Do you find it difficult, even though you, I'm imagining you have men who seek you out? Do you find when you get in a room or in a meeting as such, do you find it difficult for these men to express exactly how they're feeling? Do they not know? Do they have a problem telling you what they do know? I tell you, no, not necessarily. Um, what I have found is that when you get men together in a, quote, safe space, um, which let's define what that means for men emotionally safe. Well, from whom exactly? Uh, it's interesting to hear from women, the, the softer, kinder, gentler sex men are scared to death of women. And what will women think of me? Um, well, they think less of me. Am I less of a man? If you put a bunch of men into a room together and it's only men, there's going to be crying. There's going to be a lot of vulnerability. There's going to be a lot of, I was molested when I was a kid and a lot, of, you know, all, a lot of the deepest, darkest. A woman walks into the room, watch the men sit up straight. <clears throat> nope, nothing wrong here. Dab in their eyes. Nope, <clears throat> I'm cool. I'm cool. So it's interesting not to go off on a, any kind of quasi-political tangent here. But when you hear a lot of stuff about toxic masculinity and stuff like that, I always kind of say how ironic that I think that's born out of a lot of fear of women trying to outman each other like, I'm the one worthy of women here. I'm the tough guy. And behind the scenes, they're just sniveling little boys like the rest of us. Um, so yeah, by the time men work with me, usually they're via the, the DSO fraternity. And usually they've been talking a lot amongst the group and already became vulnerable and open about everything within our online discussion groups. And then they take the next step with working with myself or somebody else one-on-one, -on -one, and then they let it all out. So usually they just let it go. And we've already cultivated an environment where they feel very comfortable doing so. That good. That good. How would you have been different? Maybe how would have that, that I guess that time after your divorce, how would have it been different or would it have been different at all if there would have been a you right after your oh, divorce? Very good question. Maybe it would have expedited the process um, because there was years of a lot of mistakes. I would have loved to have somebody pull me aside, you know, put their arm around me and say, dude, just chill out with, this, this, and this, you know, come get over here. What you're doing is very typical, but you know, it's okay. It's understandable, but you're about to make some mistakes here. Don't, you know, every guy wishes we had that. It's a lot of things. I, I wrote a book recently called real talk and it's for uh, young men, uh, teenage boys going through puberty and everything. And it was basically me saying, I wish I had this when I was a kid. My dad never pulled me aside and said, you're at that age. Now, let me give you some little words of wisdom here. Let me tell you what, what you're in for. Let me tell you what uh, could go wrong and blah, 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 blah. No one ever did that with me. And so I wrote a book about that. So in similar vein, post-divorce, boy, it would have been nice to have a coach, so to speak, or somebody to go, all right, post-divorce, here's what's going to happen, dude. And uh, it's funny when I give that, here's what's going to happen to guys. Um, they think I'm some kind of soothsayer or, or psychic medium or something because it's so on the money. And I say, it's, it's not that I'm so wise or it's just that, it's a testimony to the universality, I guess you could say, of the human condition and how um, we're just so very similar and how we respond to things psychologically and all our stories are so similar. And I find myself saying, oh, let me guess. This and this happened in your divorce. How'd you know? Let me guess. She and she said this and this, right? Yeah. How'd you know? Well, because we're all the, we're the human animal. We're very predictable. Are you perceived as anti-female? You know, I think the knee jerk reaction is yes. Um, the knee jerk being when a usually woman um, sees my material, anytime you point out, and this is probably not so much a testimony to uh, don't misconstrue this as the, the, the dumbness or evilness of women or whatever, but it's just a cultural thing where it's, I often give the example of if I were to sit down in a room of people and say, okay, look, Rapists, murderers, psychopaths, serial killers, 
child molesters are usually men. And everyone would go, yeah, that's true. That's true. It sucks. You know, it's not me, the men speaking, but yeah, that's true. We know a lot of crazy men out there. And then you say, and women, you tend to be the more neurotic of the two when it comes to couples. A lot of women go, well, hold on a second, Mr. Misogyny. <laughs> 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 I could even see that. I can see, hey, I will accept all of that violence and stuff, but yes. you will not. <laughs> How dare you say that I have a tendency towards negative thought? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, ladies, you got to ease up a little bit. And us men, we have no problem saying, yeah, we got a lot of faults as the male species. My God, we do a lot of shitty things. Oh, we've all known shitty bosses, shitty friends, shitty. Mm. Oh, I, I, I used to work for a really giant company, and there was a point in this in this giant company where I could look around the room and go, he's cheating. He's cheating. He's cheating. He just got divorced because of cheating. He's cheating with her. It, it was just, it was a soap opera of awfulness and 90% of it was the men, but I don't come out of that saying, God, all men are just fucking terrible. No, it's just, there's a lot of terrible men. And guess what? Ladies, there's a lot of terrible women too. We're all human beings. We're all capable of some really awful stuff. And to say that is not sexist. In fact, it's quite the opposite. If you ask me, and usually when women dig further into the material, if you want to call it that, or the content that I produce and listen to whatever that their man is involved in, because we have a lot of married men in the group, they come out saying, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah, this is cool. But the knee-jerk first thought is, you're saying, what about women? You must be one of those guys. Like, yeah, no, not necessarily. When I hear that, you know, the whole rapist and all that stuff, what I find ironic is that we men, where we are the perpetrators, we tend to also be the ones who get affected most. We, you're right. Violent crime, we get hit more than anybody else. It's we only seem one, we only take one side of that. And I've always, yes, yeah, so I don't, yeah, exactly. I'm not getting on the political thing with you, but <laughs> I think we're at the same page with that. Um, let's continue. The next letter in the word prize is R. The word is resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. You kind of went over it, but I'll ask anyway, can you think of a particular situation, something that happened to you where you discovered you had resilience that you didn't know that you had? Yeah. Well, just in general, the whole divorce thing and going through all of that, like I said, I could have gone down the rabbit hole of all that uh, negative behavior. But basically, when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about coping because life is going to throw a whole bunch of doo-doo at you all through your life. And you have to be able to go, all right. <laughs> Let's see what else you got, life. Or let's just take a calm break here and deal with this methodically, rationally. And this is this has happened to me. All right, let's deal with it. And what I've found is, oh boy, is that sorely lacking in men and women both. Um, a, a common refrain from a lot of men that I work with is, how the hell am I supposed to deal with this? This being whatever. The wife cheated on him, whatever. H how do I deal with this? And often the answer is, you just do, dude. It's life that happened to you, take a time out and just say, all right, what now? What do I do? How do I resolve this? Can it be resolved? Can it be fixed? Um, men typically, in comparing the two genders, were pretty quick about, um, and this is to the much to the aggravation of the other sex, something comes into the periphery and we are very quick to say, uh, to analyze it and say, is this something that I can address? Is this something that is very important to me? Can I fix it? If no, get out of my face. It's off the plate. I don't, why worry about it? Why stress further about it? Uh, well, women on the other hand tend to say, bring it. Yes. Pile it on the plate. Yes, please. And they have their plate as a giant mountain of issues. And we're just looking at them like, why do you bring this all on yourself? Why do you keep stacking so many issues in your head? I, I only put like four or five things in my plate. If it's not, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't come on there. And that's when women say, we don't care about these things. Be honest with you. We don't, <laughs> we only have room for four or five things. I don't care about the rest. It's got to be really freaking important or something I can fix really quick. Um, but when you're in a, a state of stress, anxiety, those little coping, how do I deal with, how do I quantify and, and fix in a, in a quick, methodical, rational way, that all goes out the window. It's just everything's a disaster. This is awful. I'm never going to recover. Ah. So I think that's where help from others can come into play. You know, again, we're going back to the old proverbial arm around the shoulder saying, uh, um, you know, it's all right, dude. Everybody's been through this. Here's what I did. And take a time out, not a big deal. And there are, there's some very basic life coping mechanisms, as they call it, that are healthy. Exercise, exerting yourself. The most basic and duh thing in the world, 
and yet so many people don't do it, especially when you're so busy with four kids and a job and the da and the da, 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 da. And then you're going to tell me I need to carve an hour out of my day, three, four days a week to go move heavy objects or sweat profusely. I, I don't think so. Well, guess what? That solves a lot of freaking problems. That's a very healthy, good coping. And we have guys that do that and they go, this has just solved like eight problems that I had right there. Anxiety, psh, gone. You know, feeling bad, psh, gone. Health issues, gone. Um, and for some men, oh, now I'm getting more attention because I look better from the opposite sex. Well, there, that's a positive. All kinds of cool things. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, what was the word? Resilience? Resilience, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um... What I hear you talking, I feel like I might be wrong. When you deal with men and we're trying to deal with our situation, there's a directness to dealing with men. This happened. Uh, well, you could cry about it. Actually, if you want to, you can. But when you're done, what are we going to do to fix it? We're mm. very much, we acknowledge the problem. Then we acknowledge what the solution is going to be. We get right to business. That's I feel like that's yep. men in general. We're problem solvers. Something's broke. Can I fix it? I don't discuss how it broke. I'm not concerned <laughs> about how many times. What can I do right now? That's yeah. and I feel like that's men in a nutshell. So I feel like that's why it's even better mm -hmm. for what you for what it is what you do. You get a bunch of men who deal with men, how men deal with life. Yeah. What they, happened to me is just life. I one know. um one positive feedback I get a lot of my writing in my books is they are not long books. And guys read them and say, Oh, thank God. I love how you get to the damn point. Because <laughs> they will read, there's some really good books put out there in the relationship sphere by a lot of women. Um, Esther Perel's one, Emily Nagoski. There's some very popular multi billion bazillions of copy sellers of these books. And you read them and they're exhausting, at least to me as a man, because it's just chapter after chapter of, didn't we already say this? Didn't we already? We're just feelings, feelings, feelings. I don't, what? No, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this, you know? Men like instruction manuals. Insert tab A into slot B, blah, blah, blah. This is how you fix this thing. Next chapter, go on to the next. Here's something to try. Boom. All right, cool. I will try it. That's what we like. It's funny. You talked about, uh, I don't need to analyze this situation. <laughs> I pointed this out. I noticed my mom and my wife do the same thing. For instance, with all the kids in the house, there's a sock on the floor, an errant sock. Um, they stop and go, what's the sock doing on the floor? Whose sock is this? Why is this here? What's going on? Why isn't this in the hamper? Is where's the other sock? What, and my <laughs> solution to that is sock, pick up, put in the hamper. <laughs> Done. Problems over. We don't need to analyze a sock, but I'm watching these, both these women do the exact same thing. It's hilarious. Just a difference in how our, our mind processes things. Yes, sir. That's we get to the point. It saves yeah. time. At least for us, it does. Yes. But I, my wife does the same thing. Why is this here? Sweet, you know, whatever. I know what you mean. Um, I'm enjoying this conversation. This is cool. <laughs> we skip <laughs> we skip the I in the word prize hmm. and we go to the next letter. The next letter is Z. The word is zeal. Enthusiastic zeal. devotion. I love this word. Enthusiastic devotion. Taking, so let's put aside family, wife, kids, all that. And to a degree, a lot of what you do. Put all that stuff aside. What mm. are you enthusiastically devoted to otherwise? It would be this business and all this stuff that surrounds it. And it's I'm blessed in the fact that this business is so multifaceted and all these different little things I do. It's not like I'm just, you know, um, I'm trying to think of something. This isn't a slam against this at all blue collar work, such as I put carpet in all day. Um, right. If that's, you know, that's all I do. I do carpeting. If you get your zeal and your energy and your oomph from that, great. But I'm not wired that way. I, I need a lot of little challenges. And I get bored easily. And um, so this this provides me with that that zeal for sure. The the busyness and the, the to-do list, which is constantly growing and mounting of things to do, trying to build up this business empire, if you want to call it that, um, keeps me plenty busy. And I have to have the energy to do that. Um, if I don't, oof, that's not good. And, but here's this, here's the negative though. I was just talking to somebody yesterday about this. Um, it, has there been a, a personality shift in me post-divorce and everything else? And I would say yes. And the personality shift is in terms of energy and go, go, go. I don't know. It's almost like a permanent manic state of busyness. Something flipped a switch there. And I'm just like, I only have so many years left in this planet. I got to go, 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 which is great. Things get done. If you'll notice successful men in the world. They all have that kind of edge to them. Go, go, go. I only have so many years. Let's, let's jump. Here's an opportunity. Jump on it now. Go. And I'm bringing that energy. 
but I'll be damned if it doesn't wear you out. And sometimes you got to take a time out or else you can burn out pretty quick or else you start getting irritated with everyone around you or else, you know, whatever insert negative thing here. And so um, that's where your loving partners and stuff tell you, you're not going to go work today. Are you? Because you just worked the last seven days in a row. I've barely seen you. And yeah, you're right. I do need to take a time out. It's not good for me. And um, that's something I need to work on. Me relaxing doesn't happen all that much anymore over the past 10, 11 years. And uh, it, there's nothing wrong with relaxing every now and then and just vegging out. Those guys love to veg out and do go into our nothing box, you know, as they call it. And just, ah, and I haven't had that much. So, but knock on wood, no heart problems, no blood pressure issues. No, <laughs> that That's usually good. comes part That's and parcel good. with all of that. So, yeah. So in my constant, you know, talks with men, one conversation, one occasionally something comes up and I was talking to him about time management and I have an 18 year old son, college, all that good stuff. And when you hear that term, you think about being able to juggle a few things. For me, talking to my son, college, work, you got to be able to get this done. This is in high school. This professor is not going to bug you about that about that project. He's just going to give you an app. You got to handle your business, time management. But then we got to this whole other conversation, kind of what you're talking about. Time management can also be recognizing that today really could be your last day. You need to handle your business now. Mm -hmm. You want to start that business? Don't wait till tomorrow. I'll start it tomorrow. Mm, get started. Yeah. I don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be dark about it. But heart attack, stroke, die sometimes, peacefully. Sometimes you got to get dark about it. Yeah. Um, I talk to some men that are, that are in some very toxic relationships with women that are objectively not good for them, like really bad stuff. And the men are trying like hell for decades to fix it because we're fixers. And I often find myself saying, dude, how old are you? 51. You got a good... A maybe a good 25, 30 years of life left in you, quality of life wise, active doing things. 25, 30 years will go by like nothing. Dude, I was 20 yesterday and I'm almost 50 now. This stuff goes by fast. So are you going to waste another moment, another breath saying, no, I'll fix this eventually. You're going to go to your grave saying, ah, eh, shit, that was dumb. <laughs> I should have I should have spent the last 30 years uh, doing something else, moving on to plan B. So, yeah, it's uh, that's kind of dark. But that's 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 reality, dude. Yeah, that's goes Sometimes by fast. You gotta put that yeah, so true. Yeah, you said that. I mean, I'm 47. I turned 48 in a few weeks. I'm like, same I'm here. Busy. Same here. Yeah, like <laughs> there's about to be a problem. I need to get some things done. But <laughs> what I think is interesting, the last letter in the word prize, it is E, and the word is expectation. Expectation is defined as a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. So you spend a lot of time talking to these men in whatever situations they're in or coming out of. When a client of yours is done with their time with you, what are you expecting them to have gotten from their time with you? I would say a game plan, a, a no-nonsense look at their situation, um, not to slam on therapists and counselors out there because a good one is worth their weight in gold. There are some good ones out there that are lifesavers. But just like with everything else in the world, you know, the old Pareto principle where 20% of the people do the best work, there are a lot of bad therapists out there. And I speak to a lot of men who spend thousands of dollars on a therapist only to come out that going, what was I supposed to do again? What, uh, what did I get out of that again? Um, other than I feel a little worse than when I went in about my situation. So again, with the man brain being what it is, insert tab A, slot B, instruction manual. Here's what I think you need to do, dude. And I know you don't want to hear it because for a lot of those men, it's you need to get the hell out of Dodge. You're in a very bad, unhealthy situation. You need to get you and your kids out of there. That's the worst case scenario. Um, all the way to you, my friend, are the cause of a lot of your problems. And um, you've been a lazy do nothing, blah, 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 complaining, negative, depressed guy for a long ass time. And it's caused you a lot of problems. It's time to get on top of that. And dude, that may mean going to see a therapist and work on some of your baggage from your childhood, of which a lot of the men have a lot of. Talk about things that men avoid. While men are very vulnerable and everything, and 
they do dig somewhat into their past. Men seem, seem to be, for whatever reason, very resistant to, um, I went through some shit as a kid and it has caused some subsequent problems down the line. And I haven't properly dealt with those things as an adult. And those issues are bubbling to the surface. And that's why I'm in the situation I'm in now. Men see that as almost like an inherently very weak thing to say. I'm blaming my youth and my inner wounded child. No, that's that stuff's for the psychologist, mumble jumbo, whatever. No, it's like, no, dude, that's pretty much everything. It all starts from there. And um, that's not a nice thing for a lot of men to hear is uh, you need to start at the beginning, start all over. Because the line I often use for men, if you don't, you're going to end up in this position that you're in now with this woman going through the divorce and everything else. You're going to do it all over again with the next one. And it's kind of creepy how much uh, history repeats itself. Yeah. Almost uh, word for word. You know, a lot of men go uh, when they go into a um, new relationship post-divorce and they'll go through the relationship with what we call the rebound chick. The one that breaks their heart all over again. And men often say that actually the the... the the heartache from that actually feels worse than the original divorce uh, because they had a sense of hope and, oh, the universe is correcting itself and God has rewarded me with this awesome woman. Oh, shit. She's just like my ex-wife. <laughs> and um, it's a giant uh, mind up for a lot of guys. And I said, yeah, yeah you're going to do that again and again and again. You're not addressing the issue here. You're trying to use these women as human band-aids to fix all your problems. And that's not where it's at, dude. How about you give women a break for a good year and just work on you? Well, that's tough for a lot of guys to hear. Take a break from women, number one. Say what? <laughs> but I got nice. these, man. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be you'll be fine. You'll live. Mm -hmm. the, the women ain't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I said, and uh, and thing two, the tough, tough part is yeah, just work on yourself, my man. And that's really, really tough. I feel like it's it 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 feels like an excuse, and it's not an excuse to be like, you know what. I didn't have the best relationship with my dad growing up, so I'm not good at communicating. I don't want that. I don't want to, you know, that's not why this happened. Maybe it is, you know, to, and it's not an excuse. It's a reason. A lot of what we, a lot of how we act, how we respond to women, res respond to other guys, jobs. It's because of what we were exposed to growing up. And it's a big thing to accept. But once mm -hmm. you accept it, it's like, you know what? I'm not this bad person that I might think I am. I just got dealt this hand. This is what I, this is what I grew up. I don't know any different. It, the, it, the phrase I use is tools in your emotional toolbox. We don't all have the same tools. And it, some people don't have <laughs> any tools at all in their coping toolbox. Um, but uh, we're all be given certain programming as children and certain tools in our toolbox. And we bring that into our relationships. And when you work on it and you recognize it, you have these little aha moments in adulthood. You know, for example, let's say you had a bad relationship with your father and he was very contentious and he really made you feel like crap and he was always putting you down. And just by a knee jerk program reaction, you noticed that was how you responded to something your kid did. Your son does something stupid and you say something hurtful and you see him slump his shoulders and turn around and you go, ah, I just did the old dad thing. What my dad did. Son, come here a second. I'm sorry. What I did was wrong. Okay. That was bad of me. I apologize. Give me a hug. Give me a kiss. Um, son, that was really shitty. Do me a favor. If I do that again, you let me know. All right. High five. Let's go play catch. If you don't have that little mechanism in your, in your brain of saying, I recognize all these things from my past, those little moments don't happen. And uh, that's what called growth and maturity is all about. And it, it is a generational thing. You know, talking about that dad issue where put it, I guarantee his dad did the same and his dad did the same. And nobody raised their hand and said, time out. This sucks. I shouldn't do this anymore. Why can't that be us now? Why can't we start that? Did your divorce change? What's the right word here? Did your divorce change how you see masculinity? Excellent question. I would say so. Yeah. I would say probably I'm more in the, um, for lack of a better term, I was going to say like a hyper masculine. I hate the terms, the alpha male and all of those stuff, which is very Me big too. in the internet and stuff. It's a little, <laughs> mm -hmm. stop it with it. But mm -hmm. um, probably if you want to use those terms, I am more, the, 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 the needle is going in that direction more than what it did in the past. In the past, I prided myself 
the right way to set the right uh, tense. I prided myself on being sweet, loving, maybe hyper agreeable. Yeah, that's fine. You know, whatever, whatever's fine. I was that guy. And I, you know, that was, that was my claim to fame, so to speak. I'm that dude. I'm everybody's buddy. And then, uh, you know, life has a way of kind of waking you up. And, uh, it's funny when I went through my divorce, um, I had, a, a not a lot, several platonic female friends, older women that I worked with and uh, going through what I was, I was very open with them about everything I'm going through. And when you hear two or three of those women in a row tell you, you know, you were a really nice, sweet guy. The problem is, is that you were a really nice, sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you just, uh, you let a little too much go. It's okay. I think I had uh, two or three women tell me, it's almost like they all got together somewhere and decided, you know, we need to tell Ralph this stuff. But they said, uh, you know, women tend to like a guy who's a little bit of an asshole and you don't have that in you. In other words, in their vernacular, what they're saying is you need some more boundaries to use the psychology term. And you don't have any. And they were right. I didn't. Um, I used to, well, it's funny. I used to. Much of my development is basically, let's go back to pre-marriage, pre-kid Ralph. And let's let's rediscover that dude. Because it's been hidden under a blanket of all this domesticity and marriage and fatherhood, which all have their awesomeness, but it doesn't need to permeate and become the entirety of you. You still need to hang on to some of that old you, and I didn't. Now I'm going back and rediscovering the old, you, old me. So it wasn't... Um, necessarily a complete transformation into a new version of me, but probably to be honest, more of a rediscovery of an old, old version of me, like two or three versions ago. I hear that. I, I kind of hear myself in you and what you're talking about. And just sometimes just, yeah. no, babe, we can't do that. No, I don't like that idea. Got to inject yourself in situations. Otherwise it's one-sided and then you're never going to be happy in that. Are you a better father after the divorce? You know, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. Um, I uh, it's kind of sad because I look at my relationship to my uh, my middle child because let, let's say pre-divorce, I didn't. You know, my kid was only one year old, so I didn't have much. The youngest was only one year old, so I didn't have much of a time to build much of a history there between the two of us. So, looking at the middle boy, for example, um, we were attached at the hip. You know, wrestling every day, coaching all his teams. He was my little man. He was always with me, doing everything making funny videos in the backyard the whole nine. And when you lose time with them and you're so hyper-focused on, well, now I got to spend a lot of time with this one-year-old, sorry, middle son. And I got to worry about my daughter who's going through a lot of anxiety and emotional issues as a result of the divorce. And so those two extremes are taking up a lot of my time, middle kid. And so, sorry, your, your, your dad mentor has gone, not gone away completely, but he's been diminished quite a bit. So looking at it from his perspective, he would probably say, yeah, pre-divorce, dad and I, were we really had a good thing going. And after that, it went down quite a bit. Now, emotionally, I'm always there for the kids and everything else, but it's not the same, you know, having that good quality time. Um, so there's give and takes. While I'm rediscovering myself more and becoming a more, what you consider a healthy, selfish guy of got to take care of my, my body. I got to uh, take care of my career. I got to do all this stuff that I've been kind of um, uh, ignoring for the last decade or so. Uh, something's got to give which means that hour a day, five days a week that I work out, that's five hours in a week, less time with kiddos. But with that being said, um, my background, my, my family and my, my wife's family, she's a second wife, um, are both from Europe. And so there's some cultural differences there that we have both noticed, my, my family being from Spain, my wife being from Germany. Um, we as Americans tend to be very hyper kid focused. Um, we almost worship our children to an unhealthy degree where they become our everything. And to hear if there are some people that would hear me saying, I spend five hours a week at the gym and not with my kids, they would go, Ooh, dude, what are you doing? And that's not right. While in some cultures they would say just five hours, <laughs> you know, my they, wife would say my husband and I get away from the house an hour and a half every day for a long lunch together. And we leave the kids with the babysitter. We go to, and there's such a child focus, especially from the woman's side in America, where women are just uh, very, very anxious and very, very hyper attached to their kids. They don't want to let them go. That um, it's to the detriment of their marriage. And if there's something I can see that was in part the downfall of my first marriage it was we had zero time for ourselves. We didn't see the importance of setting time for us as a couple at all. There was nothing there. It was just we were 
in a job, coworkers in a job, and the job was running the family machine. That was it. There's, uh, I know on social media, I've seen there's always been discussions or questions about a kind of a hierarchy in terms of life for a spouse. Is it husband or wife first, then kids, or is it mm. kids first, then spouse? So you're kind of, in a way, kind of talking about that. So it sounds yeah. like, are you at the point of my wife and my kids are close second? Yes, I would say or so. In- because if not, then the whole machine breaks down. If you don't stay connected to that wife and you don't show those kids, look, mom and dad are very attached. We're still dancing in the kitchen, giving each other kisses. We're still doing all that. We're still attached. And by the way, kids, watch this. We're going to leave you with grandma. We're just on a random Wednesday. Your mom and I are going to a dinner together. We'll see you in a couple hours. We're going out for dinner and drinks and we'll be back. And the kids internalize that and say, mom and dads make time for each other. That's a cool thing. And it's not going to kill the kids to be alone with grandma for two hours on a Wednesday. That's fine. Um, and this, while this is making a lot of American parents go, oh my God, it's okay to leave your kids overnight too with somebody. And you and the wife go get a hotel somewhere and just go dancing or do whatever. Act like, you know, the couple that you used to be. Nothing wrong with that. I did none of that in my first marriage. Zero. My wife and I now make a point of saying, Oh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done something. We got to do something. It's it's always at the forefront. It's always right there in our face that we have to do this. And we recognize it's if we don't, the shit can go south in a hurry. So you have daughters. Mm-hmm. How do you think your daughters see dad as a man? Hmm. Well, the youngest is only one year old. So, so she don't know a thing. <laughs> See, I'm just I'm just funny bald man to her. Probably a funny bald man to the 18 year old too. Um, <laughs> I would hope that my oldest daughter would say that I'm a pretty good balance of a lot of different things. Um, we're very open, and she tells me about boys that she's talking to and that she's getting to know. And I can see in a roundabout way that sometimes maybe she's saying they have this part over here, Dad, but they're kind of lacking over here. She's hanging out with one boy, for example, in college, and uh, she sends me pictures of him frequently. Almost as say, look how funny he is. Look at this funny thing he's doing. And I just flat out say, is John's not his name, but I say, is is John boyfriend material? And she just laughs. Says, oh, no, no. John is friend material. <laughs> John is friend material. And so she's very open about those kind of things. Now, how much is my model for men and influence in that? Where is she looking for best of both worlds? I hope so. So you'd have to ask her. But I would hope to instill in them that, yeah, you need a good balance. It's got to be the friend guy, and it's got to be the guy that makes you go, ooh, who's that? And um, it's tough to find, though, to be honest yeah. with you. It's very tough yeah. to find. And um, you got to be okay being alone with yourself, have, comfortable in your own skin until you find that person. It may take a while. That's that's easier for men to say than it is for women. Women have that old biological clock thing going, and I'm 25, and I want to have a family, damn it, and I'm 30. Oh, my God, the sky's falling. But uh, us men, we we can take our time. A little easier for us to say. Yeah. So the last letter, well, the middle letter, but the last one in this kind of mantra that I do here, the letter is I, and it doesn't represent a word. It represents the person that I'm speaking to. So the typical podcast question, but I will thrust it upon you. When you take away all the stuff, when you're not a husband, ex-husband, father, employee, best friend, gym rat, all the things that kind of represent you when you throw all those things to the side and it's just kind of you at your core, who are you now? Well, I'm a guy getting a call from my daughter right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a quinky dink. Um, well, that, I mean, that's a good philosophical question. When you strip away everything we do, who are we? Are we all the same at the core? Oh, wow. Now we're really getting into it. This is like uh, <laughs> This is like Nietzsche kind of stuff. <laughs> so, who the hell are we? What? Uh, I don't know. Get to the basic of it. When you strip away all that, what are you left with? Who you were as a little boy prior to life piling on stuff? Um, who have, who was, who have I always been? Maybe a good way to look at this is who have I been from childhood? What, what kernel of self has maintained throughout all these decades and years? And I would say primarily probably a, um, it's going to sound like I'm 
uh, inflating my ego or, or but primarily a friendly person, kind person and helpful person, I would say. That's always been under the surface of all of this. You know, what else am I going to say, right? Well, underneath, right. I'm an asshole. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, that's always been there. And uh, I think I've always been a a good friend, um, a good, well, I was going to say, I think I've always been a good spouse. I throw myself under under the uh, bus there. Marriage number one, not necessarily. Um, I was a good father and I was never unfaithful. I was never mean. I was, don't get me wrong, but there's more to being a spouse than just being a, a parent who doesn't beat their spouse or doesn't yell at them or does, never says an unkind word. It's a job. Spouse is a job and it takes a certain set of skills and personality and so forth. And I just didn't have that in marriage number one, but wasn't emotionally mature enough to handle all of that. And it took life to kind of smack me upside the head and say, wake up dummy. And, uh, and another whole dating phase and courtship phase into marriage number two for me to go, ah, oh, yeah, all right. When my 40s now, I see how it's done. But uh, so I always had that kernel of at least goodwill and 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 kindness and, and helpfulness there to prop me up and guide me on my way, I guess. Thanks for answering the questions in the prize mantra. I appreciate that. Uh, a few more to throw at you. In talking to men, two things are are apparent to me. One, we don't take care of ourselves, ourselves, us. And two, we don't recognize the value in having somebody to talk to. I, this almost feels too perfect considering who I'm talking to. We don't have a person to just lay at their feet everything that's going on. We kind of internalize it. We just kind of keep it. Mm. So... So my two questions are one, what do you do, you, Rob, when life is hectic? You got a lot going on. How do you self-suit? How do you take care of you? Um, I think uh, outlets for me, because that's what we're talking about, outlets. When you have that, you got to let it out. I'm blessed to have this group that I started that I'm also belong to as a member to let things out and learn from others. Um, but I'm also a creative person. So the writing thing is one of my creative outlets. Another one, as you can see behind me, music, guitars. I love playing not well, mind you, not here in my basement by myself. But it's, I tell you what, if I don't do that for several days, it feels weird just because it's very much part of me. And uh, when I was a kid, I was very much into art in terms of uh, drawing and uh, uh, painting and stuff like that. So that's always been a part of me and it's always been an outlet. And I understand that's a personality trait that's in a lot of people. I'm creative. And if I don't have that, I feel off. And it's that thing's got that whatever energy has got to come out. So I have that part of me. So that's very big in what I do. So basically, if I were one of these guys that had to work some kind of blue collar job where it was, you know, 12 hours a day of grinding it. And then I come home and I'm exhausted and I just want to collapse on the couch and wake up at 6 a.m. the next morning and do it all over again. I'd be a miserable sack. That just sounds like hell on earth to me. I couldn't do that. I need those. I need that time and other things, avenues for different kinds of outlets. Do you have a friend? So we have to put aside family, spouse, mom, dad, all that stuff. Do you have a friend who you could pick up the phone? And you have to, obviously, you're in groups. But um, you pick up the phone and call a guy. I did some really dumb shit, really stupid. I don't know why. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. You have a friend who you could call, tell him this. He would get on your ass like a man would. Why did you do that? You're an idiot. But when you were done with that conversation, you felt you were able to let it go. Yeah, you have outside, a lot of men yeah. don't have that. Outside of the group, the group is a given. That's what it's for. But outside of right. that group, if it didn't exist, yeah, I do. From uh, my previous pre-kids life, um, I cultivated a couple of really good friends that are still friends to this day. In fact, we're getting together here in a, a month and hanging out in Las Vegas uh, for my birthday. So very cool. Right. Um, so those are one, two guys that I could do that with. And they've done that with me over the years. They've been there through some traumatic things. It was there for parents' death, breakups, divorces, and all that stuff, and vice versa. So yeah, we've been there for each other. And um, boy, that's something that's sorely lacking for a lot of guys. We just lose that connection. Um, it's funny, my story is so similar to so many others where I used to live here, made good friends, and then career, family, whatever caused us to move clear across the country, across several states, and I've lost that connection. I've never regained it because I got so busy with kids and family and everything else. That's very, very common with me. And that was my story. Uh, when my uh, first wife left, it was basically me going, 
Well, it's kind of weird because all the friends I cultivated were via her job. They were her friends' husbands. And now that we have this contentious thing going on, and it's, now it's weird between us. Mm-hmm. And it's and to this day, it's still weird between us. And uh, so, well, time to cultivate some new friends. Easier said than done when you're home with three kids, four kids, and all that other stuff. Yeah, and as a dude, we're just not as social as women are. And uh, we're just busy doing what we're doing. And now... If it wasn't for the uh, DSO fraternity, um, which you can find more at dadstartingover.com slash join, um, uh, I wouldn't have much contact with men at all. I mean, I do, I'm running around all over the place, driving this kid to this, driving this kid to that, doing this thing. Then next thing you know, it's 930 at night and I'm putting one kid to bed and I'm sitting on the couch going, what am I going to do? Pick up the phone. Hey, dude, let's go have beers. No, I'm stuck at home with three kids. <laughs> so that's a life for a lot of guys. And with that said, you kind of mentioned it, but let's get into it. Talk about where my listeners and watchers can find you, can find DSO, the fraternity and everything. Drop it all. Tell all right. All about it. The, yes. the hub of everything is dadstartingover.com. You can find everything right there. Dadstartingover.com, all one word. There is a Dad Starting Over podcast. There's a Dad Starting Over YouTube channel. You can see me on Twitter. Um, Facebook is very big. It's got like 70,000 followers on Facebook and it grows every day. Um, the others are, are falling way behind Instagram and all that. Uh, the fastest growing as far as daily edition is a relatively new, only several week old social media account at TikTok of all things. It's you hugely big. It's just growing like crazy. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at it in the last hour, obviously. I bet when I go on there, I'll probably have like 50 new followers and hundreds of comments and everything. It's just huge. So I had no I idea. That's that there I, found were, you. I had no idea there were men in this sphere on there. I just thought it was a young woman thing or young kid thing. I, really, I've been kind of ignorant of that world. And 90% of it is insanely annoying. <laughs> I can't stand it, but hey, if it works and it gets the word out, that's what it is. So look for me on there. Dad's starting over on TikTok. Um, the DSO fraternity, you can see right at dad starting over. You can jump right to the page at dadstartingover.com slash join. I also bought DSO fraternity at DSO fraternity.com. Um, the uh, most people find out about me, strangely enough, through that book that I mentioned, The Dead Bedroom Fix, which is about sex and marriage. That has brought mo- more eyes to my website than anything else. And so we have a lot of guys that are in marriages or fresh out of uh, divorces or fresh out of marriages that didn't work. And their main pain point in life as a married guy is or was uh, the lack of sex. So I wrote a book about that, what I think on the topic, and that got hugely popular for whatever reason. And um, I've sold them uh, hundreds of thousands of copies of the thing. And it's brought a lot of people to the website and a lot of people to Facebook. So I had a really big upfront jump when that book was very popular. It's gone down in sales quite a bit since then, but uh, that brought the bulk of people to me to start with. And that really got me rolling. So I was very lucky and blessed to have that. I know most people that, hey, let's start an online presence. They look at me and say, how the hell did you do this so fast? Because I had a book. So write a book and cross your fingers that it sells well, basically. <laughs> so that's it. That's it. as far as <laughs> avenues to find me, dadstartingover.com will get you everywhere. Fantastic. All right. This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for talking. Absolutely. With me. Thank you. Thank it. you. Oh, no, this was good. Um, I... I don't know. I haven't been divorced, but I feel like I'm no, I'm, th- I'm thinking because just this conversation, while it hasn't focused strictly on marriage, just focus on men. And I feel like just men in general, just not always about how we're dealing with leaving a relationship, but just our inner psyche, just us and talking about me and having these problems and where they came from and what do I do about it? Who do I talk about it with? It's a good conversation. And the more I talk to men, and even when I talk to men and I'm not really the person, I'm trying to help them, but it's still a good feeling to talk, to have a conversation with another guy. Mm -hmm. It's such an important thing and we don't realize it. So that's why I really created this podcast and to have conversations like this. So it it was a pleasure. Everything you mentioned will be in the episode notes. So if you want to find Ralph and dad starting over, all that stuff will be in the notes. Um, how do I end this? Find someone to talk to, man. There you go. That's it. That's, that's what this podcast is, but you reinforce it. Make a friend. Find a friend. Recognize above all things that you're human. That any issues that you have, you may not have been the cause. Something Mm -hmm. else might have happened and there's nothing wrong with getting help. There's nothing more masculine than getting somebody to hear you and help you through your struggles. Amen. Very well said.
Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you to you. Thank you to all the men and women who listen to Men of the Prize, the podcast where your inner monologue is revealed. Have a great week. I'll see you soon. Thank you.